Slide 1. Welcome to Networking and Health Information Exchange, National and International Standards Developing Organizations. This is Lecture A. The component, Networking and Health Information Exchange, addresses what is required to accomplish networking across and among disparate organizations that have heterogeneous systems. As one might imagine, this topic covers a lot of territory fraught with new topics and a lot of acronyms. My apologies, but it is what it is. I think it is more important to understand what the acronym is rather than what the letters stand for. I suggest you keep your glossary beside you as you study this material. This unit covers national and international standards developing organizations and consists of three lectures. Over these three lectures, we will discuss the value of health data standards and why there should be global standards. We also introduce you to the national and international organizations developing standards, as well as other significant organizations that influence the creation or use of health data standards. In Lecture A, we talk about standards and their importance to the healthcare community. The biggest current change in the healthcare model of today is the need to share data across different sites of healthcare within a single hospital and across hospitals, clinics, doctor's offices, nursing homes, and others. We will discuss in this lecture what standards are required to support the network that provides connectivity and what is required for a patient's data to move among the various sites of care. In addition, we will discuss other needs for networking. Examples include the submission of claims data to Medicare and Medicaid, insurance companies and other payers. Reports need to be made to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, state agencies and other groups. Slide 2. The objectives for this unit, National and International Standards Developing Organizations, are to explain why standards related to networking and health information exchange are important, particularly in the current environment. Standards development, which includes how standards are developed, who develops them, how standards are accredited, and how standards are selected. Slide 3. We continue to define the objectives of Unit 3. Understand the different kinds of standards being developed and for what purpose. Learn about standards developing organizations and the standards they create. Demonstrate how to find, obtain, and use standards that are needed to facilitate networking and health information exchange. It is likely that you will hear the word standard every day in some setting. In some cases, the speaker will be referring to standards that are produced by a formal process. In other cases, the speaker will be referring to a general concept. Much of the content of this unit will be referring to formal standards. Some standards will deal only with the words we use and the characteristics of those words. Others will deal with actually moving the data from one unit to another. What is required so that the received data is understood by the receiver? Other standards will refer to applications or system components that may be used without creating special interfaces to permit the application to work with other systems. A number of organizations produce standards. Some are U.S.-based, some international, and some both. The organizations mostly create standards for specific purposes. In some cases, standards from different organizations compete for the same functionality. Unit 3 will define some classes or categories of standards that you may encounter in your work. We will discuss how to find, obtain, and use standards from a variety of organizations that are needed to facilitate networking and the sharing of health data with others. A word of warning. This unit includes many, many acronyms that are part of the everyday language of the people who create and use standards. We will always first give you the words, then the acronym. Once defined, we will use the acronym in future slides. Slide 4. Standards are a necessary part of life. We are able to exist as a society because of standards. We could not buy different products and put them together without standards. Standards permit us to work with things and people without having to agree as to how we would do that in advance. 
standards save money by eliminating the need for customized interfaces. Without standards, the world would be chaotic. Can you imagine driving your car without any rules? Demolition Derby time! Standards permit us to work with components in which the parts have no prior connections. This topic is important to you because regardless of what job you might get in healthcare, you will encounter and use standards. Slide 5. When you buy a loaf of bread, take it home and put it into your toaster, it will fit because the bread industry and the toaster industry have agreed on a standard for the size of a slice of bread. Even so, we might have problems. Try putting a large bagel into a toaster. Some fit, others do not. You can buy a CD or DVD and expect it to work in your machine regardless of the brand, a reward for standards. Standards are everywhere. A slice of bread, a pair of shoes, clothes, tables, doors, windows, railroad tracks, paper sizes, appliances, the shape and color of a stop sign, the colors and meaning of traffic lights, the frequency and voltage of electricity, dates, time, time zones, time units, and many other things. It's interesting to think about how many things work together only because of standards. Tires on a car or bicycle, for example. Can you imagine how many things would not work without a standard? Slide 6. Here we see a depiction of an analog clock digital clock, an hourglass, and a sundial. What is different about these four methods of indicating time? Are they interchangeable? What is different and what is the same? Is the precision the same? Is the accuracy the same? When are these differences important? Do you have a digital or an analog watch? When might your choice be a matter of taste and when might the choice be dictated by the requirements? Many of the standards we will discuss are necessary because of the requirements. Slide 7. There are over 50 different styles of wall sockets in the world. Most international travelers will carry a set of plugs like these. There are now devices on the market that reconfigure to adapt to most plugs. Unfortunately, many standards are not global. How many travelers have blown out an electrical appliance when they forgot that much of the world outside the U.S. uses a standard of 220 volts rather than 110 volts? Many countries drive on the left side of the road rather than the right. An American driving in London might have difficulty adjusting to the different driving rules. Slide 8. Current vision in health information technology requires the integration and merging of data across all sites, forms, and specialties of healthcare. With the advent of new models for healthcare, new focus on health surveillance and public health, and consumer health, sharing and reusing data is mandatory. We use the term interoperability to define what is required to enable this functionality. The biblical story of the Tower of Babel illustrates the importance of communication and understanding. The artist of the illustrated picture is Peter Bruegel. When the workers started speaking different languages, the work stopped. Slide 9. In order to communicate, there must be a path for communication. The connectivity infrastructure is an important component for interoperability. In many settings, how to accomplish the physical connectivity is a challenge. We have many choices – landlines, cable, wireless, satellites, and other technologies. Many factors, including costs, culture, the environment, and what currently exists influences the selection. Beyond the physical connections, which were covered in detail in the first unit, there are other requirements or standards that must be used to be interoperable. Slide 10. Since many parties are involved, there must be some governance infrastructure. Decisions involving standards, knowledge, and process must be made and enforced. As we will see in other parts of this lecture, someone has to select the standards and methods that will be used. Decisions necessary for interoperability relate to standards, data, knowledge, and process. 
Ideally, these decisions will be made by experts who understand the technology and the requirements. At a national level, the government must be involved. The interstate system of roads is a good example of the federal government, the state governments, and the local governments working together. The national government laid out the national plan, where the roads would go, and wrote the specifications for the roads to control quality. The states contracted with private business and local governments to contract the work using the standard specifications. Slide 11. This slide illustrates much of what this entire component is all about. We must understand what's in each of the circles here. Data, transport, storage, application, exchange, and make sure information is not lost as the data moves from sender to receiver. We must all understand the data. We must speak the same language, and data must have the same meaning between sender and receiver. We must have physical and logical standards for the transportation of the data so that meaning, context, and provenance is preserved. The data must be stored in such a way that the receiver can retrieve and understand the data. It is important that storage permits easy navigation. The challenge is to find any and all data regardless of how it is stored. More than one exchange can take place. Again, provenance must be retained. Finally, interoperability must exist within the applications. Many standards are involved to enable operability as depicted in this diagram. The process of selecting which standards to use for which parts is called profiling. Slide 12. One of the problems is that many groups produce overlapping standards. Whenever we have any options, different people will select different options and we lose interoperability. There are some areas in which we have not defined standards, or at least selected which standards will be used. Often, a group will come to understand they need standards to accomplish a task. All too frequently, they will make their own new standard rather than looking around to see if a standard already exists. That is why we have so many similar and overlapping standards. An important point to make is that if one group uses one standard and another group uses a different standard, interoperability is broken in connecting the units. A customized interface or mapping from one standard to the other must occur and usually results in the loss of information. Slide 13. The U.S. government has many groups that are trying to determine and recommend what standards are to be used for what purposes. Over $19 billion of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act ARRA, stimulus funding will address Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, or HITECH. Key to success are standards to enable the sharing and understanding of healthcare data across the nation. Both of these activities are engaged in providing funding for the use of standards and for creating the workforce to support these initiatives. Slide 14. The Office of the National Coordinator, ONC, has the responsibility to influence and coordinate the use of health information technology in the U.S. Two committees have been created to aid the ONC in this work. The Healthcare Information Technology Standards Committee, HITSC, and the Healthcare Information Technology Policy Council, HITPC. These two committees identify and recommend policy, HITPC, and standards, HITSC, to achieve the goals of interoperability for healthcare delivery across the U.S. HITPC was responsible for creating the draft requirements for meaningful use, for example. The curriculum development grants and the university-based training grants are awarded through ONC to create a workforce for a ubiquitous healthcare system across the U.S. Slide 15. Standards can be made through four different processes. The first is the government can create standards and require their use. Examples include the National Institute for Standards, 
The Food and Drug Administration and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services also create or influence the creation of standards, as do other government agencies. The second method is de facto standards. A large organization with a lot of power in the market can create standards that the community will follow because of the market value. These are the so-called 800-pound gorillas. Examples include Microsoft, Apple, Intel, and other powerful groups. The third approach is ad hoc standards created by a group of, usually, vendors who get together and create a standard. An example is the group of imaging equipment manufacturers who got together and produced an imaging standard called Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine, DICOM. Continua is another group creating medical device, personal health device standards. There are many examples of this approach. Finally, a more open procedure for producing standards is the consensus method. Most standards developing organizations, SDOs, that are accredited by the American National Standards Institute are consensus standards. This approach requires a mixture of stakeholders, not dominated by any one group, to define and agree on a standard protocol. Health Level 7, the National Council for Pharmacy Drug Programs, Accredited Standards Organization X12N, and ASTM are examples. Slide 16. It is important to establish some authority for standards, both in terms of quality and sustainability. The authority can come from the government in the sense of mandated standards. For example, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, mandated the use of several standards for reimbursement. A single vendor with a market share can effectively mandate a standard. Vendor agreements by groups such as the Electronic Health Record Association, EHRA, can agree to use a set of standards. And finally, SDOs accredited by an authority body can be the source of authority. Slide 17. Who creates standards? Unfortunately, there are many groups that create standards. The result is competing, conflicting, and overlapping standards. The result is inconsistency in what standards are chosen, defeating the purpose of standards. We refer to a group that creates standards as a Standards Developing Organization, SDO. Some SDOs are international, others are U.S. only. Most SDOs come into being because of a single focused interest. As the scope of the interest spreads, so does the scope of the standard. Soon, the standard-making activities spread over other areas and we have conflicting standards. The next series of slides will identify these SDOs. Slide 18. This slide identifies important international standards organizations. International Standards Organization, ISO, ISO TC215, Healthcare Informatics, European Committee for Standardization, SEN, Health Level 7, HL7 International, Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine, DICOM, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE, and Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium, CDISC. This list continues on the next slide. International standards are important because many U.S. vendors sell their products internationally and international vendors sell their products in the U.S. Some international standards may be used in your place of work. The next lecture will discuss each of these SDOs and discuss the type of standards created by each organization. ISO is international and SEN is European. The other SDOs started in the U.S. and evolved into international organizations. Slide 19. Other international SDOs include GS1, International Healthcare Terminology, SDO, IHT SDO, and Joint Initiative Council, JIC. 
GS1 is a large international standards group best known for its barcoding standards and its supply chain identifiers. International Healthcare Terminology SDO, IHT SDO, is an international organization whose primary product is a terminology known as SNOMED-CT. The Joint Initiative Council, JIC, is a collaborative organization that brings many of these international organizations together. Slide 20. There are several organizations that are strongly connected to the SDOs as well as organizations that create standards not specific to the healthcare industry. Some of these organizations are World Health Organization, WHO, Object Management Group, OMG, Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, IHE, Open EHR, World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Standards, OASIS, and Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF. In the international setting, there are other organizations that create or support standards making. The World Health Organization, WHO, is the source of a terminology standard used around the world called the International Classification of Diseases. The Object Management Group, OMG, has created business standards including service-oriented architecture that you will learn about later. OMG also is responsible for the Uniform Modeling Language, UML. Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, IHE, is an organization sponsored by Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society, HIMSS, and Radiological Society of North America, RSNA, and is known primarily as a profiler, that is, IHE identifies the standards that are used for an end-to-end -end network. IHE also has defined rules for registries of documents and for the transfer of those documents. Open EHR is an open source group headquartered in Australia that is best known for data structures called archetypes. World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, has defined the rules for web services on the Internet and is responsible for Extensible Markup Language, XML, and Hypertext Markup Language, HTML. The Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Standards, OASIS, defines business standards. The Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, defines networking standards. Slide 21. This slide shows U.S. standards organizations. ASTM, ASC, X12N, National Council for Prescription Drug Programs, NCPDP, Medbiquitous, American Dental Association, and International U.S. CDISC, DICOM, HL7, IEEE. ASTM is actually an international SDO, but its healthcare activities are only U.S. ASC X12 is U.S but has had ties with United Nations Electronic Data Interchange for Administration, Commerce, and Transport, UN EDIFACT, a UN-sponsored international SDO. National Council for Prescription Drug Programs, NCPDP, deals with medications including reimbursement. Medbiquitous sets standards for managing academic teaching, courses, evaluation, and simulation. The American Dental Association creates dental standards, which may intersect or overlap with other health data standards. Several SDOs operate strongly both as international organizations as well as U.S. organizations. Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium, CDISC, DICOM, HL7, and the IEEE are SDOs that are both U.S.-based and international. Slide 22. Other related U.S. groups include American National Standards Institute, ANSI, U.S. TAG to ISO TC 215, National Institute of Standards, NIST, 
SDO Charter Organization, SCO, National Quality Forum, NQF, Office of the National Coordinator, ONC, HIT Standards Committee, HITSC, HIT Policy Council, HITPC, National Library of Medicine, NLM. ANSI is a standards accrediting body and is the U.S. representative to the International Standards Organization, ISO. It holds the Secretariat position for ISO Technical Committee 215. As such, it supports the U.S. Technical Advisory Group, TAG, which represents the U.S. interests in TC215. NIST is a U.S. government organization responsible for a broad domain of standards primarily related to measurement science, but more recently has responsibility for setting up rules for the testing and validation of health IT-related standards. NIST does have interests in the area of medical devices. The Standards Developers Organization Charter Committee, SCO, plays a role in the U.S. similar to JIC in the international arena. Its purpose is to bring the U.S. SDOs together. The National Quality Forum, NQF, is responsible for defining quality measures. ONC and its two committees have already been discussed. The National Library of Medicine, NLM, has responsibility for the Unified Medical Language System, UMLS, NLM also represents the U.S. as a member of the governing body of the IHT-SDO. In spite of SDOs still producing competing standards, there is a lot of linkage and overlap among the groups. In fact, many of the active persons who work in producing standards will be members and actually active in multiple SDOs. If you are interested in participating in any of these activities, all are open to membership but most charge a membership fee. Slide 23. At the top, in purple, are the international SDOs that are members of the JIC. In the yellow bordered box are the U.S. SDOs who are members of SCO. Note that HL7 and CDISC participate in both organizations. ANSI supports the U.S. SDOs as an accrediting body as well as being the U.S. path to ISO. IEEE is international, creates many standards beyond health informatics, and participates with ANSI in the U.S. and with ISO through an agreement. IEEE, however, is not a member of JIC or SCO, mainly because of its broader interests. DICOM's focus is on the broader international community. It also participates with ISO through a liaison agreement. DICOM is not a member of JIC or SCO, but does have a liaison relation with ISO. IHE is an organization that is part of HIMSS and RSNA. In the controlled terminologies, we have SNOMED, controlled by IHT SDO, LOINC, MEDRA, drug allergies, a product of the International Conference on Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Registration of Pharmaceuticals for Human Use, ICH, Current Procedural Terminology, CPT, Procedural Codes Required by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, and owned by the American Medical Association, AMA, and the ICD codes, owned by WHO. CH has formed a relationship with HL7 and a liaison with ISO. Slide 24. This concludes Lecture A of National and International Standards Developing Organizations. In this unit, you have learned that standards in HIT are essential to accomplish the goals of interoperability. Goals of ubiquitous, patient-centric electronic health records require data about each patient to be aggregated. Access to and use of that data requires interoperability and, in turn, requires standards. Most standards in HIT are consensus-based standards. That means that all the stakeholders come together and define the standards that permit them and their products to work interoperably across sites and distance. 
There are many groups, both national and international, that make standards or have a tight relationship with standards. At the present, these groups produce redundant standards, forcing decisions about which standard to use. Efforts are in place to harmonize the creation of standards.